I love teaching innovation and creativity because it changes lives. Many of us grew up believing that creative people are just born creative, that's why they are that way, and then the rest of us are not creative because we were not born that way. And that is a limiting belief that we can fix with the right methodology. My favorite methodology to do so is design thinking. And uh, design thinking is a problem solving methodology. This means two important things. First, if you ever have a problem, design thinking is for you. And second, that in order to use the design thinking methodology, we need to start with a problem. We have a problem that we need to solve. Most of the times, this will be businesses trying to solve the problem for their customers, entrepreneurs trying to solve problems for their users. And uh, these problems can be one of two types. Type number one is that the current reality in which this person that we want to help is has a pain that we need to remove. This person has a pain that we need to get rid of. The second type is that there is a pleasure that they desire, but they cannot achieve yet. They need something to change something so that they can achieve the desired pleasure. And that's where design thinking comes in. The first step of design thinking is to empathize to practice empathy. This means that I am able to feel what the customer, client, or user, what the person that I want to help is feeling. There's, of course, um, a better way of doing it, which involves the senses. The first thing that I will always need to do is active listen. If I am listening actively, I'm going to be able to detect the nuances of the problem, the nuances of the situation in which the person, the person is feeling the pain that we need to get rid of or the desire for the pleasure that has been identified. Once I do that, I can move on to the next step. The second step of design thinking is defining. And I've got a great example for that. Say that I come to you and I tell you, I am here to solve all the problems for all the people in the world. I got a startup that's gonna solve all the problems for all the people in the world. Do you believe me? I bet not. And there's a reason for that is that the more that we focus, the more likely we are to succeed in resolving a problem. So in the second step, define, we need to define two important things. First, the person that we want to help. We came with an empathy map of a certain customer, certain user, but how many people like this one are we gonna find out there? What's the scope? What things can we change to make a broader target audience or maybe a narrower one? What will increase our possibilities of success? And it's normally the narrower audience. We want to help a clearly defined target audience. And even within that target audience, these people are going to have many problems. Many of them are going to be similar to or related to the problem that I'm stating that I'm going to solve. Which of those am I going to consider? Which are they going to be in my desire to resolve my uh, design thinking process? And which of them are going to be left up outside? I'm not going to be covering them. That's outside of my scope. I'm going to come out of the defining step of the time thinking with a user persona and a specific description of the problem 
that I want to resolve for this persona. The third step of design thinking is also my favorite step. It's ideation. And uh, it's too bad that the ideation process is uh, defined as, was, as a single, single step in the design thinking process. It's actually two different steps. The first step is going to be divergent thinking. And the second sub-step is going to be convergent thinking. In the divergent phase of ideation, I start with a singular definition of the problem that I'm going to solve for my target audience. And I come up with all the possible solutions to that single problem. In the convergent part of the ideation step, I start with all the possible solutions and I refine them all the way until I have a single solution that I'm going to implement. It's important to define them as different sub-steps. They cannot be mixed together because the rules that will guarantee success in divergent thinking, if you apply them to the convergent part, you're going to fail miserably. And this, the opposite is true, is, is the rules that are going to guarantee your success in the convergent phase of ideation, if you apply them to the divergent phase, you are going to fail miserably. What are these rules? When you're doing divergent thinking, you start from a singular definition and explode to all the possible solutions to that problem. We want more ideas. We want more solutions. We want more options, more possibilities. More is better. That's the rule. And uh, the greatest crime that you can commit in this phase is judging your ideas. We are so used to judging ideas before even speaking the ideas, before ever writing them down. We think this is not such a big idea. I'm not gonna tell it to my team. I'm not gonna write it down. I'm not gonna add it to the process. I'm gonna discard it. That is completely forbidden in the divergent part of ideation. We need all of the ideas. More is better. You are not allowed to judge an idea in the divergent phase of ideation. This is, go this is what's going to allow, uh, allow us to have all of the ideas ready for the next phase, which is convergent thinking. And in convergent thinking, the rule is the opposite, because we start with all of the possible ideas, Normally in my workshops, this would be thousands of possible solutions to a problem, but we need just one. So this is when the rules of the game change. Here, more is not better. Less is better. But what kind of less? You're not going to discard an idea just because you need less ideas. You're going to discard an idea because you have a better one. So we need a set of criteria to determine which ideas are better than others. And um, the most basic ones are, for example, if an idea is repeated, we don't have space for two ideas that are the same idea. We're going to merge them into one. There you go. You have less ideas. In the divergent phase, more was better. In the convergent phase, less is better. But not just less in quantity. We want to keep the best ideas and discard not the best ideas. The next criteria would be, for example, clarity. You wouldn't believe how many ideas get promoted into products and services that are not clear enough. And this is not a path to success. We want to succeed and in order to achieve success in the later stages of any 
problem solving process, we need clarity. What exactly are we doing? If an idea is confusing, not very clear, it can be misinterpreted, we are probably gonna, if not discard it, at least save it for maybe a, a future project, but we are not gonna act on an idea that is not sufficiently clear. And uh, in the end, we are gonna rank the remaining ideas and there's going to be one best idea that came from the thousands of options, the thousands of possibilities, there's one that is the best idea. And that's the one that we're gonna move to the fourth step of the design thinking process, which is prototyping. Prototyping means bringing ideas into the real world. We need to build what we thought of. So it's gonna start with the idea here. The first prototype is a clear thought of what we are going to do. And when you're, we're gonna start testing it from here. The fifth step of design thinking is testing, but we start the testing in the prototyping phase in a lighter manner. If I am able to express the idea clearly, that is a test. If I tell the idea to three different people and the three different people write down a similar thing, that's a test of the idea, of the clarity of the idea. If I uh, give instructions to 10 different people to draw what I'm describing and they end up with similar drawings, that is a test of the idea. That is, that's a test of the clarity of the idea. We are getting more specific, more high definition in the prototyping phase. Once that we have this kind of clarity, we wanna have it on paper or digital. We're gonna be able to share it with our user, with our customer, and ask the greatest question of the problem solving process. Will this work? The first step was, I have it here, it's a thought. I can express it with words. And I'm gonna ask, will this work? The real user is gonna say, well, yes or no, or I don't understand or something else. Then we're gonna bring it on paper or digital. We're gonna share it with a real user and we're gonna ask the question, will this work? That's gonna be a yes or a no or something in between. But we are always looking for feedback, even though the fifth step is testing and it's a different step, we start using the feedback loops in the prototyping process to improve the prototype as we make it into more specific and more highly defined prototypes. Once the prototype on paper or digital is working, we wanna build a model, a 3D model of the thing. And we're gonna share it with the user. We're gonna show it to the user and we're gonna ask the question, will it work? We're gonna get a yes, no, or something different. And that's gonna bring us to the culmination part of the prototyping phase. This is the MVP the minimum viable product. We are going to, to, melt, to, to make, to build a working prototype. This is a prototype of such definition that it actually resolves the problem for the user, for the customer, for the real person that we wanna help. It goes and solves the problem. It's effective, but not just that. It's a minimum viable product. Viable means that it works. It does indeed solve the problem, but minimum means minimum. We are not gonna paint it if painting it's not necessary for solving the process, the, the problem. We are not gonna add beautiful stuff or additional features, none of that. What is the minimum product that still solves the problem, that if I remove anything from it, it stops working. That's minimum. That's what we wanna 
give to the user to start the testing phase, the fifth step of the design thinking process. We take the minimum viable product, bring it to the final user, to the real customer, and uh, leave it to them. Use it. I want to know what happens. We normally will give it for a day, maybe for a week, and we will be continuously asking for feedback. The first feedback that we're looking for is, did you actually use it? This is a very important question because some of the products and services that we can build invite the user to use it. Some others don't. We need to pay attention to that. And of course, once the user has it, once the customer who has a problem gets the minimum viable product that can solve the problem, that's where we need to ask the real question for real. Will it solve the problem? Turns into, did it solve the problem? Yes, works. How about no? How about it? no, it didn't solve the problem? Well, that works too. Because we're going to be asking why it did not solve the problem so that we can fix that. What we're going to get out of the testing step of the design thinking process is feedback. We need to ask basically three questions. Did it solve the problem? What can I add to it so that it solves the problem better? What can I subtract from it so that it solves the problem better? These are like the cold questions that we need to incorporate in the prototyping process. And um, there's also two important emotional questions that are much better um, if we can see the user using the product. And uh, the questions that we are looking for is, was at any point the user frustrated? was at any point the user confused and you wouldn't believe how many times a uh, user experience that we carefully designed that was straightforward for us is going to be confusing for the user the user is probably going to stop using the product because the user journey that we defined is not the same that they normally do they're going to start get confused and leave the product assigned aside. That's the feedback that we need. Where was the user confused? Where was the user frustrated? And that we need to change. We go back to prototyping, remove whatever confuses or frustrates the end user and bring it back to them and ask for feedback again. And uh, namely, those are the five steps of the design thinking process. Theoretically, we are finished here empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. But it's never over. The, the design thinking process is iterative. It means that at any point, whenever I gather additional information, I can go back to any of the five steps. I can meet a new user who helps me understand better the emotions of the problem, I go back to empathize. I can meet a new user who has a more complicated vision of the problem that I had already defined. I'm going to go back to the define step of the design thinking process. On the ideation process, I can have additional ideas that I didn't think that they were not included in my thousand of possibilities. I'm going to go back to the ideation process and see if any of these additional ideas are even better than the ones that I had. I am always going to go to the prototyping process. It's a live thing. It doesn't die. It's the prototyping process goes on and on and on because even when the problem itself is not necessarily changing, people are changing. Maybe this problem is more important for them than it was before. Maybe there's a new technology available that I didn't have last week that's going to make my 
minimum viable product better, much more powerful. I need to incorporate that into my product so that I can serve better my customer. And of course, testing. Every time anybody uses my product or service, that is a test. And it is up to me, it is my never ending responsibility to gather the feedback from that experience, to bring it back to my prototyping table to make my product or service even better. And uh, that's about how the design thinking process works. And this is how I can demonstrate over and over again that everybody is creative.